We will now move on to our second panel on the international experience of pension reform councils and commissions, as part of which, in addition to learning more about the global situation in the world, we'll also learn more about the work done in the Toledo. And in order to get down to business, it is my pleasure to introduce our two panelists, William Price, who is the CEO of D3P Global, and Jose Antonio Erce, the founding partner of Longevity and Retirement Income Solutions, Loris. William and Jose Antonio, a warm welcome. I would like to introduce our guests. I will first introduce Jose Antonio. Jose Antonio Erce is a BA in economics. He is a founding partner at Loris, and uh, he is um, also um, a member of uh, Loris, which is a Madrid-based professional partnership. He has been associate professor at UCM until recently, where he taught micro and macroeconomics and growth theory. He has also delivered economics uh, courses and lectures at Colegio de Mexico, the Juan March Center for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences and Afi Finance School. He has regularly published books and articles in Spanish and international academic journals, such as the document we are sharing with you through the chat. He's very active in regular and social media and uh, delivers lectures. He's an expert in longevity and pensions and chairs the experts board at BBVA Pensions Institute. He's a member of the BBVA Center for Financial Education and Capabilities Global Advisory Board. And he's a member of the experts forum at the Santa Lucia Pensions Institute. He's one of the national experts of the Real Return Report Group, Better Finance, and a collaborator of the Selfies for Retirement Security Network created by professors Robert Murphy and Aaron Muralidar. So a warm welcome to you, Jose Antonio. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks for joining us. William Price is CEO of the D3P Global. He has extensive experience in the public and private sector on regulation, investment, risk, and social policy in financial services with focus on pensions and retirement income. Before D3P Global, he worked for the World Bank, the UK Treasury, UK Pension Regulator, and in collaboration with the OECD and the International Organization of Pension Supervisors. He has worked on all aspects of the public and private sector involve, involvement in pensions and the insurance and pension payout phase, with clients including developed and developing countries, the IMF, the World Bank, IDB, UNDP, and UNCDF. He has published widely as well, including as contributor editor of Saving the Next Million, the Next Billion from Old Age Poverty on the design of private pension systems, on ESG and pension funds, on the role of viable annuities to improve retirement income. Uh, his first degree is from Oxford University, and he has a master's in economics from University College London. He, he is an ambassador of Transparency Tax Force and the Share Foundation, and is on the advisory board of the Toronto Center Insurance and Pensions Program. So William, welcome as well. I'm happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks very much, much gusto. Yeah. Very well then. So I would first like to give the floor to William Price. Great, well, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Laura, and to Ios and to Paulina. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it was um, great to be able to um, hear the earlier panel. So um, it's uh, a tough act to follow, but let me see how we'll do. I have the bad news that all of my slides have 12 points on them, but I have the good news that I only have one slide. So um, I'm not going to give you too many. Um, and maybe just as a, a, an entry point, really, what I'll go through today is some of the experience from the UK, um, which is perhaps quite well known, um, but I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, there's a slide that will follow that has lots of references for anybody who wants to have more um, information or insight. It's quite a well-documented reform process now. So there's um, some really great work that people have done if you want to kind of look at it in a more deep dive way. Um, but as well as the UK one, I then want to 
kind of draw on some examples internationally that we've been involved in um, over the years, uh, you know, through the various organizations, um, OECD and the International Organization of Pension Supervisors, or when I was at the World Bank, or now with D3P. Um, and I guess one overall message is actually kind of why we founded the company and actually the company name. So the D3P is because there are three elements, big elements to a pension reform, the diagnosis, the design, and the delivery. Um, and one broad reflection actually on the UK and then pretty much on most of the other reforms that we've seen is there's a lot of work on the um, diagnosis and the design. Um, but nearly always there's not enough work on the delivery. Um, and it's not just sort of thinking through the various institutions um, and maybe the legislation and the regulation. Some people spend more time on that. Some people spend less time. But increasingly, um, you know, there's a, there needs to be a very strong focus, I think, or we think from the very beginning on the, you know, things from the IT side through to the procurement side. So the people around the table for your pension commission, I would, we would argue sort of going forward, should include the people who will be right at the end of the chain. But the earlier they're there, um, the easier it will be. Um, and as I'll sort of go through, you know, the final model that was chosen in the UK, you know, it didn't use a Swedish and the UK model, I'm sorry, the Swedish and the New Zealand approach of using the tax authorities or the Social Security Administration to help deliver it, which in some sense seems like a very sensible thing to do. Because at the time, the tax administration, um, what they call HMRC, was having a, a very difficult time and was failing to deliver multiple major reforms. So there's a major reform of tax credits, which was fantastically important for poverty relief. But they were systematically having problems to the amount of billions of dollars of either overpaying or underpaying. So that, you know, you don't think, I very rarely see people talking about, you know, the IT infrastructure, the enforcement infrastructure, who's going to, are you going to be procuring from a public market um, as part of their thinking? But it can be incredibly important. And what we've seen in countries around the world, you, I won't always give the examples because sometimes it's a little personal to the country, but you know, they had a model, it seemed like it would be really good. They then went out to the market to tender and they find it very difficult either to get good value or they've already told people exactly what they want and they, um, everyone knows that there's a political imperative which puts you in a kind of weak bargaining power. It also Wait, means- sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I think we are not seeing the second slide of your presentation. Just no, so I'm going to move in a second. So this ah, is just okay. the Yeah, yeah. Just just, just, um, sure. Wait, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Please go ahead. No, no, perfect. And, um, and so by the time you go to the market, and typically, you know, you have to put the thing out for three months or six months and review the tenders and do the contracting, and you add another year or two potentially to getting the thing done. And the reason for starting with this, which may seem like the final thing to think of, is it picks up on um, comments that people were having just now about how long do you need for the Pension Reform Commission? And I would completely agree, three months is not enough time. Six months would, I think, maybe give us a heart attack. But um, you can do lots of things. But when we think of how long this thing is going to take, it's not only the Pension Reform Commission, it's then all of the implementation. And if it, say, takes a year or two to do the commission and you come up with a great um, delivery model, if you then have another two years in terms of not only the implementation, but just the procurement and getting everything done, it becomes very risky. And, um, and at that point, I then will move on to the kind of points, uh, the sort of specific ones, because if, I'll start with the kind of reflections on the UK pension reforms and sort of sharing some really nice work that has been done internationally, uh, sorry, been done looking at the UK. Um, and then, then also some kind of um, some reflections from having been more an observer than a participant some, most of the time. Um, and one of the biggest things is it took an extremely long time. Um, and I think it, the commission started its work in 2002. They did early reports, um, but broadly it was a two-year process. The first 
pension member enrolled under the reforms comes in in October 2012. So that's 10 years after the commission started, maybe eight, maybe seven years after the commission finished. And of course, you then have the legislation. You then had a, an election um, in between which returned the same government and then an election in 2010 which returned a different government. And both before then and after, before 2010 and after, there were very significant attempts by the industry, the financial services industry, to stop the reforms, partly by employers because they were worried about burdens on employers. Um, and so lots of the things I'll go through in terms of um, being useful were absolutely vital in the context of the UK pension reform because it did last so long. So you needed sort of an even better reform commission than normal because it was a big risk to have such a long duration. Um, let me give you the kind of big picture of what, um, I guess, the academic review is like. Um, and just to skip to the next slide, as I say, there's a whole bunch of references if you want. People may well have seen lots of this material before, but the commission, the Turner Commission reports, which will go into the interim and the main one, there's a review almost no one ever talks about in 2010 called Making Auto Enrollment Work. This was another, um, fortunately, they chose the right person um, at a time when there was very significant pressure on the reforms. And then there's, some, there's a nice report looking at the whole passage of pension reforms from 1997 to 2015 uh, by Nest Insight, one of the um, participants in the UK's pension reforms. There's another, a shorter note from the Institute of Government. Um, I put in a link to, I don't know, The Guardian is a sort of reputable newspaper, but there's a link um, just to so you can see the kind of press coverage and the amount of um, attacks that there were, because it's very easy after a successful reform to think everything was fine, but it was often quite tough. And then the final review, the final point, the Hutton Review of Public Sector Pensions is, um, again, people don't really talk about it very much, is to kind of make the point that um, Though the Turner Commission on the UK covered lots of issues, it absolutely stayed clear from some. And so public sector pensions, i.e. the pensions of the employees of the government, just were not even considered. And so it was the Turner Commission was a broad report, but actually, you know, it didn't try and do too much. So let me go back to um, these points. Um, now, so what's the first point in terms of thinking about the commission? is obviously, you know, what's the alternative to the commission? Um, and, you know, indeed, even what is a commission? Because um, those experiences that I, um, or those references on the next page, you have the well-known Turner Commission. It looked at how to expand the coverage of private pensions or workplace pensions in the UK, reverse 30, 40 years of decline, try and come up with solutions given that, um, Lots of other solutions have failed, new products, financial education, different tax incentives, you know, publicity. Uh, none of that stuff had worked. Um, so it was, a, it was something with multiple governments by that stage. It was the kind of, I suppose, the history of failure, if you like, with multiple governments understanding it, that was an important reason to think, you know, you want to have a multi-party, cross-party commission to look at pensions. Um, and it was the Prime Minister of the time, Tony Blair, who was very keen, of, keen to have it. Um, and so it seemed a natural area to have a commission because of, A, it was large, but also because of the failure of previous reforms to, to stop this decades-long decline in pension coverage. But equally, you know, I think there's a timing or you need to have the right time for commission. So if you've had lots of them and they haven't worked, there may be actually something smaller, a review by a respected person, but it's not a full scale commission. It doesn't have the same duration. It doesn't have the same scope of reforms and that maybe you can, you know, sometimes you can go step by step or paso a paso to get to the place you want to get to. And it's a very practical issue. I don't think there's one, um, one right answer and so what actually the UK had done and again people often don't talk about it very much there had been lots of reviews by kind of independent and respected people on individual aspects um, so certainly the commissions are not the only answer but I think particularly when there's a big a big thing to deal with and also where 
I guess there's general acceptance that the other approaches haven't worked. Um, the third one, finding the right person. I, people have already made this point. So Lord Turner, as he now is, Adair Turner, just kind of one of these people that, um, you know, he's a smart guy and he's worked in various other places, uh, public and private sector, and is generally seen as a kind of non-partisan figure. You know, maybe you could guess his politics, but it's not something that in his career up to that point he'd been very uh, vocal about. And having someone relatively apolitical um, can be very important. But the commission, the, the two other commissioners never really get a much of a, a mention. And one was essentially from the employer side and one was from the trade union side. And they were within the employer and the trade union bodies kind of well respected as well and seen as sort of non non combatants if you like there are some people who are you know you know politics is a tough business and some people who are seen as very kind of partisan or very political um so finding the right people um i think as people mentioned um the uk model was to go for a small independent and politically astute group of people um rather than the big commission of you know 20 people and the massive long drawn out process you know i think it's going to be slightly country specific the smaller ones at least give some chance um i think for a more coherent view and for having you know people coming from very different perspectives having the chance to work with each other as kind of trusted partners and privately as well so that they can sort of run through some of the battles which will happen afterwards it's also worth saying that the people, um, and particularly the attendees, were very um, good on the media side, very good public speakers, very good um, when being interviewed on TV, um, had broad consultation. And that, that kind of right person, you want someone, you know, often people uh, who are technically very well respected are not necessarily the greatest media performers. Maybe if you're going to go for the technical person, if they're not a great media performer, you need someone who's humble enough to maybe take a little bit of, uh, you know, practice on the media side, because there won't be many chances to get the, the media side right. Um, the next part, and is linked to the media campaign, and is also linked to the, um, the discussion, discussing with individuals, the kind of the big picture messages, I think in most countries, people will get, you know, we're living longer, we've got to do something, we need changes. In some ways, I don't think people can get much beyond that. As soon as it gets into a technical level, you know, most people I, most people I know, whether they have a PhD or whether they're um, left school at 14, they kind of, none of, none of them really understand pensions. And it just is a kind of scary thing that people don't want to think about, which is, of course, why reforms like auto enrollment work, but um, all of them will get this kind of big picture thing. So having some scene setting repeated over a period of months, almost maybe the commission does it, maybe the government does it in advance so that there is, you know, something about we're living longer, something is going to come. I wouldn't be much more ambitious than that. Um, and it's interesting, actually, we know um, the Irish government is just about to, or well, it's had a, a series of reform discussions and documents about uh, public and private sector pensions is going to um, starting now to introduce auto enrollment, um, and they've just published some major documents there. You know, and they're doing a lot on the communication side. And I, you know, was talking to a graphic artist the other day who's been um, uh, asked by the government just to, you know, what are the images we can share with the public which will help illustrate this? So again, this is not the kind of technocratic side of things that maybe most of the people, me included, around this table are more used to. So do you have either someone who's very good at this stuff or around the table, do you have someone who's a very you know, good on the kind of simple communication? Um, but of course, you do need the strong technical side um, as a kind of necessary but not sufficient condition. Um, the Pension Commission in the UK was kind of well served, A, by its, the people who are driving it. So, you know, Adair Turner was a management consultant by training and um, so it's, it's more natural to do a deep dive into all of the data and that kind of thing, which, um, you know, technocratic academic uh, heads of commissions will also obviously be happy with this kind of thing. I think there's also an element to which, um, in terms of cutting the time needed, 
almost always the data side of this stuff is difficult and you're trying to get hold of information and maybe you want to do surveys of the private sector firms involved, but if they know it's in the context of the commission, it may take longer. And so having, you know, if, if you're a, a politician or a senior uh, official and you're thinking of a pension commission, I think there's a lot of groundwork that you can do in advance so that you don't have to kind of waste a lot of time. And when we work with countries about with their big pension reforms, it's often getting that initial data and the analysis, even from, say, the social security institution, or as I say, from the private firms, um, that can be very time consuming. And you don't want to be in the position of um, not being able to have access to the base data. Um, the international examples um, wasn't actually a particular feature, I don't think, of the UK. I mean, it drew on um, you know some of the good work in the US about auto enrollment, um, which it's often misunderstood as in the US doesn't have a national system of auto enrollment, as people know, it's a, you know, you're allowed to do it as part, if you have, if voluntarily you have a private pension plan, um, then you can auto enroll your workers. But, um, and then there's good academic evidence of how that changes things. A little bit, um, uh, there's some, New Zealand was a little bit ahead. But it, it's a sort of a deficiency, I think, of the UK approach to not look into the international examples. And I, I find sort of much more, we find much more openness internationally to look at those examples. Um, but within those examples, I think everyone, it, it's obviously true that you want to make this unique and specific to your country. And so hence the individual who is trusted, are, are academics more trusted than business leaders or the, someone with a finance background more trusted than somebody else. That will be very country specific, I think. Um, but there are some areas where actually it's the same in every country. In every country we've ever worked in, no one understands pensions, um, certainly in a population, but also more generally. Um, they, but they are masters of knowing, particularly people on low income know everything about where the next dollar is gonna come from or go to. So, but understanding pensions never seems to be there. Everyone, you know, the current generation thinks just for the short term and not for the long term. And, you know, if only the youth were like their parents, um, that seems to come up a lot. And the financial education side, you know, I don't know, there was never a sort of golden age, I think, when people weren't um, included, uh, sorry, weren't well educated. So, but it's a very, very tough thing to go with. You need, I would, Rudels, the, the point of a commission, I think, can be useful that they can have sort of very big picture financial education on the there's a problem, we need to take action, or in the case of auto enrollment, do nothing. Trying to do the broader, you know, you need your education materials about investment, maybe for those people who really want it. But um, I wouldn't, I'd, spending lots of time as a commission on trying to get your population up to a level, um, I don't think is likely to work very well. Um, unfortunately, um, the point on the good use of bad examples, the international work or the international examples that people often talk about is, so what's worked in, and then you want to know a country, and often we find um, people want to know what's happening in big, you know, in the UK or the US or countries which are well known for pensions, Australia, the Netherlands, but then they really want to know what's happening to their neighbours. Um, and so it's a kind of maybe like a sanity check of what's happening in the rest of the world. I would I would try and get or argue that people should try and be as open minded to the other examples. So if you look, for example, at the Indian pension reforms, and there was a great commission, the Oasis Commission, um, which helped set up the national pension system, which has one of the strongest designs of any system in the world, I think. Um, you know, they were obviously very strongly influenced by the Swedish reforms. Now, in general, you know, Sweden and India are sort of slightly different countries. But the, I guess, the open-mindedness of that Indian, the Indian Pension Commission and the people around that table who are, again, very well chosen. And then also thinking, actually, you know, so that structure could work for us, and then we will tailor it, um, I think means that you can end up the best example is not likely to be, is, or may often not be from your neighbor. Um, and so making sure that people are open-minded to the international examples, I think is quite useful. And then the good use of bad examples, unfortunately there are a lot of them. And I think this is probably underplayed. 
because on the kind of we're living longer, we need to do something, talking to the politician side of things. I think it's also really useful to flag up the consequences of what happens if you don't do something. So Greece, unfortunately for um, the Greek population, you know, they had a, a catastrophically generous system of pensions with people being able in previous generations to retire in their 40s. It was extremely It was, can I just check people can hear me? It says that I've just been muted and then unmuted. Yes, we can hear you, William. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, the Greek pension system, then obviously when the financial crisis, the global financial crisis came, the pensioners were one of the very hardest um, groups hit. And I think the cuts were about 40%. I was reading there was a news flash recently um, that they're going to some of the pensioners are going to get the first rise for over a decade. Now, it's incredibly tough if you're an 80 year old Greek pensioner having cuts to your pensions. But on the other hand, one time you were the 45 year old person who was taking their pension in an unsustainably generous system. And there's a kind of time inconsistency problem there. But using, you know, whether it's to the finance minister or the minister for social welfare or to the politicians, using those examples and saying, unless you do something, we're heading to that kind of situation and you're heading for the measures which will be 10 times worse for you politically, 10 times more unpopular than some of the tougher choices you may have to take in a pension reform. You know, in Italy, after the global financial crisis, you didn't have a nice phase, gradual increase in retirement. Um, it was a very quick increase in retirement by a series of years um, in a small number of years. And again, there are lots of other examples that people can use. Um, just uh, so in terms of consulting people, people have already mentioned this. Of course, you want to do consultations, particularly, you know, the pensions industry. That's the kind of model you have, the employers, the employees, um, the workers. I would not be surprised if people have impossible demands. So Nest, the big pension fund in the UK, they were looking into um, the payout phase, the retirement income phase, and they did some consultation with workers. And it was a kind of workers want to have, the people in this case, they wanted to have a secure income guaranteed until they died. Access to their money at all times, the ability to give a bequest, access to sort of higher returns, but with no risk. And after a while, you realize it is obviously literally impossible to deliver those things, but it then at least helps you understand the key dimensions of the trade-offs. Um, and even though it wasn't so much as a pension commission, I think um, you look at, say, the payout system in Singapore now, you have three options under the CPF life, as they call it, which are sort of playing to those kind of things which will come up in the consultation. And so your three options are you have a sort of relatively low starting point, but it's going to rise by 3% a year. And that's, are you really worried about living a long time and prices rising? You have a relatively low starting point, but it means that you have more chance of giving money to your family to a, a bequest. So is the bequest really important to you? Or you have the highest starting point, um, and you know, less chance of giving money to your family, although some chance, but you need the money now. And those sort of boiling down um, the kind of consultation responses, the views of people into these, um, into say three options like that, I, can, I think can be quite useful. Um, you know, from a UK perspective, the reason we have auto enrollment um, is because the, it's the political economy. So you you know, it may have made much more sense to have mandatory private pensions as many countries have done. It just doesn't fit with the political economy in the UK, which is a sort of half European, half North American. Other countries, it may be very different, but it worked extremely well because if, it, if people complain nonstop, or people often complain, you could say, well, just opt out then. Although then to have some re-enrollment to mean that, um, you know, you might have done it once, but three years later, you put people back in. But also it was, I think, quite clever because people talk about auto-enrollment, you know, there's an opt-out, but it's 
it's 75 percent mandatory which didn't wasn't really the focus and i think was a sort of useful not the focus so if you're an employer you must provide a pension you must enroll a worker you must contribute to that worker and then only after that can the worker opt out whereas previously there had been a system in the UK where you employers had to provide the option of a pension. It was under reforms called the stakeholder reforms. Um, but they didn't have to automatically add the person and they didn't have to automatically add, uh, make contributions. And so it was basically didn't really achieve very much at all. But the kind of allowing one quarter voluntary in the UK character, in the UK context was extremely um, important. So let me sort of coming to the um, some of the final points. The the internal problems um, are kind of I guess as interesting as some of the external. So pension commissions are often a kind of you know politicians want there to be someone who's kind of neutral. Have a reform commission, get the data, talk to people outside, lots of consultation. Um, and it can often be you know as people will know the differences, the arguments between a prime minister or a president and the finance minister, or between the finance minister and the social affairs, social welfare minister, or the employment or the business minister, whichever way around it goes into in the government. Um, and making sure that the, the head of the commission is spending a lot of time with those people as well. I think the internal, um, the internal consultation, I guess, is as important and a lot of those ministers you know they're going to have their own um potentially short-term views on things and be you know struggling for position between themselves and so the internal particularly the on the the official side so again this is quite country specific so the uk has a a tradition of a much more stable civil service as in when the ministries when the election happens you don't really, you have changes in special advisors, but you don't have changes in the lead officials. Some countries have very large changes in the official side, in the US, for example, and other countries have kind of like a medium one um, in Germany, for example. So, you know, that will be what it is in your, in your um, political economy. But having some continuity there is obviously very important. And it's one of, in the sort of top five, things of the UK reforms, it's one of the most important. Um, but it's, if your country doesn't have it, it goes back to the point on time and the duration that I was mentioning at the beginning. The UK could sort of just get just about get away with this 10 year period from the start of the commission to the first person entering, because there was much more continuity um, on the official side and the government side. Um, if you're not going to have that continuity, I think you need to move faster. And then that's to the point at the uh, expect and plan for strong pushback. Someone is not going to like it. Someone potentially powerful will be attacking it. Um, and planning in ahead. And so the commission having um, having a core group of people who can sort of almost like scenario plan. It's like you're planning for the debate. But also the media, the more media savvy person, because you will the, the press will love to have lots of people on who are going to talk about why there are problems, someone who can deal with that. But also that you've got your arguments um, marshaled in a head, uh, marshaled ahead. Um, and in a non-pension example, so I remember when I was working in the Treasury, there was um, going to be a big EU piece of EU legislation um, or a big EU reform program, which led to a change of powers. And as, you'll, as people will gather, the EU, the European Union relationship with the UK is, um, uh, is difficult from the UK side and obviously uh, eventually led to Brexit. But the official who was leading on it, I was working in the, the Chancellor's office at the time, and we were talking about it. They sent me a document. It was just absolutely brilliant, about 100 pages of every single comment and criticism that someone will have that they had spent with the team and with a simple paragraph of what the answer was. And there'll be things like, how dare you do this because this has never happened. And you'll say, this has happened five times before, or we can't agree to this because it's, and you know, you're getting ahead of the answers and you're, so I think that part, expect the worst, or what is it, hope for the best and prepare for the worst is a, a critical feature. 
Um, my penultimate one, and I'll stop soon, the believe in the sun even when it doesn't shine. Some of these are going to go wrong, and I don't think it invalidates the importance of a commission um, and all of the things that we've been talking about. Um, I just think it means that every now, sometimes there's just it's just not going to work, um, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be trying again. In the same way that you know we don't give up on education because there's a, a problem with the education budget, you know it's always going to be there, and you're going to have to return to pensions. Um, but one thing to finally leave with commissions are very tough and you know you've already heard how the incredible work that people have done and the difficulties that they face so as part of the work of a commission um and this is a kind of quite you know we talk about this a lot in the reform work we do with countries the oecd has been very good on pushing on this finding some way to embed automatic adjustments so you reduce the need for commissions, maybe the frequency or maybe how much of a difficult job they have. And the gradual change in retirement ages, the gradual change in contribution rates, it may not solve everything, but it means that at least you've got part of the solution um, sort of working on, um, on a slower burn and reducing the size of the challenge. And then the next time the commission comes, you know, Maybe you didn't get your retirement age to move from 60 to 65 in one go, but it's at least at 63 when you next look at it. Um, so because commissions are so difficult, um, that's why you'd, the automatic adjustments are important. And then hopefully that's why if a commission comes up with some mechanisms which are automatic, you know, the politicians, um, it's strongly in their interest to start agreeing to some of these things because it means that they don't have to take the same risk again. Um, so with that, let me um, let me questions after the next presentation. Thank you, Will. Thank you very much. I think you you said a lot of uh, important information. You highlighted highlighted some some uh, things we also discussed in the previous panel in the regional panorama. So I think we can highlight this later on in the global panorama. I I like what I like the most is your phrase believe in the sun even when it does not shine. So it's very important for us to keep working and to keep pushing the, the reform processes ahead. So now, thank you, Will. Now I will shift to Spanish. Ahora eh, cambio a español. Y le doy la palabra a... And I will give the floor to our dear friend, Jose Antonio Erzig. You have the floor. Good afternoon. Thank you, Laura. I'm very happy to greet you this afternoon and to chair this uh, webinar with William Price. I'm very happy with what he said. And what I have to say is a summary of uh, conclusions in the comparison of experiences of different uh, countries that have gone through important reforms in their pension systems in the last 20 to 30 years. William told us or gave us a lot of uh, arguments that uh, are uh, that could be subject to comparisons between countries, and uh, he has uh, given us some experiences that uh, have been very well described by William, uh, particularly the case of the UK, the important and comprehensive pension reform. Uh, that was carried out in that country in the last uh, 20 years. Let me now share a PDF uh, document, uh, and I hope this is distributed uh, later on. Uh, I have a lot of uh, slides, but I won't go into detail in each of the slides because we all have the main elements uh, on the table, and maybe later on in the debate, we can delve on some of the details. Uh, and uh, I would like to speak directly to the Latin American colleagues, and you will see some elements that already have come up in the debate. Uh, for example, in, if the universe of uh, reforms in uh, the countries of the region could include some good lessons, that would be optimal. But uh, 
this is not the set of circumstances that we normally see. How to bring pension systems closer to the citizens. That is the title of this uh, webinar. And uh, it, it has already been discussed by Mr. Price that uh, there is a, it's not due to the lack of uh, communication uh, means, which are very well developed in uh, advanced uh, countries, but the social security systems, both in uh, pillar two and pillar three, uh, perform very few institutional campaigns vis-a-vis -vis individuals uh, to explain on television or uh, social networks what these reforms involve. There's a very uh, little communication. If a beneficiary in Sweden, uh, you, the UK, United States, or Holland wants to know about pensions, he or she has very good information, very well uh, uh, presented in the web pages of the different agencies. Now, regarding the international uh, experience in the, on the issue of pension reform, I would like to uh, concentrate on the vehicles for reform, such as committees, the dialogue between the different agencies, etc., because I do not want to discuss the problem of uh, a certain type of pension. Uh, if that's not the um, aim of my dialogue, but what is, uh, what are the stakes when it comes to pension reform? And I would like to talk about consensus because uh, this expression is well used. In Spain, you will see that uh, I, I will refer very little to the Pact of Toledo, because that would give rise to a different conversation. I will just uh, mention it uh, because I am more interested in the experiences of other countries. However, at the end, I will mention the Pact of Toledo so that we can see that it's not uh, a paradigm as uh, it has been described frequently. Consensus is uh, something that all reformers uh, want. They all want to reach consensus. They do not want obstacles in, in their reform plans. They don't want to be questioned. They want to approve the main lines of the reform in with, a very, uh, with very few sessions. And of course, the stakeholders uh, should participate in the social uh, um, consultations. And of course, at the end of the day, the citizens have the last word. However, in many countries, there is an obsession and many academic analysts also uh, insist on having a very rapid, a very quick reform because the voters or the constituents that, uh, uh, that have a certain age range that uh, can divide the electorate in two uh, halves, the average voter is of a greater age uh, increasingly, and that uh, it can complicate the, the reform. And this is what many political parties use as an argument in many countries, but we have to fight this perception that the higher the age, the more conservative the voter. This is not the intrinsic reality of the human being because there are differences in culture and we do not uh, have the necessary arguments to combat this uh, trait or this bias in the populations of different countries. It's something that can be uh, uh, fought against. So we have to take into account that the population is not uh, increasingly older and more conservative. We are talking about money, and it's not a matter of age. It's a matter of whether the reform is adequate or not. If not, the benefits will be very scarce and the costs will be very high. We will. I will talk about... Uh, the reforms in different countries in a very uh, summarized way 
by using key terms so that you can understand the nature of the reform processes in this 12 uh, countries that uh, we will uh, describe in a very rapid way, for which I must uh, apologize in advance. And of course, there are some references by consultants uh, in this area. And the main uh, focus is to have people uh, in Spain benefit from uh, good pensions in Pillar 2 and Pillar 3, which were, are very uh, underdeveloped in our country. So we see uh, these uh, complements as very important elements in a country where social security cannot do more. Social security in Spain is has been doing almost everything for decades. It can't uh, uh, give further, further. And uh, even though, even in that uh, circumstance, workers need uh, the money uh, to, uh, so, so that they have a good standard of living at the end of their working life. And of course, there are publications that uh, can be interesting, and I will quote some of them on which I have based my uh, presentation. Reform of pensions is uh, mandatory. It's mandatory because demographics are changing structurally, and we are about to see a systemic revolution which has no comparison to other uh, revolutions in uh, history. We are talking about the, uh, the Neolithic revolution and then several uh, industrial revolutions, uh, which end up with the demographic and digital revolutions, two revolutions that we are going through at the moment. And uh, particularly the fact of uh, digitalization, which is uh, present in all our activities. So this will be, uh, something that will increase day by day. Uh, every time the, the new uh, generation that is born can live longer than the one before. Longevity has uh, been present in the uh, last uh, century and a half, but uh, the increase of, of the age of the worker is something that we see and we have been seeing it uh, in the last century. Because if you have uh, a contribution that is adequate, this contribution may not be adequate in the future due to longevity. We have to reform pensions and the sooner the better because otherwise we will have very high costs in the future. And pension reform is not something that can be delayed. Some commissions in several countries think that they can spend decades talking about pension reform without going into action and concrete proposals. And they think that uh, solutions can be found in the future, but uh, they don't see the short-term uh, situation. So some of these reforms involve a lot of social energy and they must be done well from the beginning. And uh, we have to share efforts so that our children can benefit from these uh, new pensions. In order to grow in this uh, system, we need to start uh, early and we need econo economic mechanisms that uh, will have uh, a good result from the beginning. So let's go to the idea of consensus. 
consensus is uh, not uh, a technical issue. It depends on uh, the person who managed or the persons who manage these uh, uh, processes. And it's very difficult to achieve. There, there's the, there, are, there are many stakeholders involved, uh, particularly in, from a parliamentary uh, standpoint. So uh, it's uh, not a matter of uh, pushing reforms uh, against the collective will. You have to negotiate. And uh, sometimes it happens that the opposition has, uh, is, is composed by a series of opportunistic uh, parties that uh, want to oppose any type of uh, reform. So you need political agreements uh, to uh, have a, a good pension reforms. And this we have seen in Spain during many years, and we need to continue um, pushing these uh, reforms uh, in spite of the opposition of these uh, political parties. So these facts many times uh, uh, are not uh, fulfilled if you have a political pact, the Pact of Toledo, uh, it, many people think it has uh, given good results, but it doesn't, it's not the case because uh, we have not been successful in avoiding uh, the decisions that are not uh, popular. So every party has to, be able to give a little in order to reach a consensus. Uh, the concept of an average voter is not something I favor. Uh, this idea that uh, uh, you have to involve only trade unions and uh, the older workers, that could be good in certain circumstances, but uh, uh, in interest of the future, voters, many times the newer generations are starting to come into the labor market and they should be taken into account because otherwise the fact that the population is more conservative as uh, they get older is uh, something that can constitute an obstacle. Uh, young people are also important uh, in the control in the social contract and we uh, uh, countervene these uh, social contracts sometimes and we do not uh, think about the consequences we, it, it is uh, us who manage these contracts and not the you the youth of the countries so there's a series of uh, perceptions that are wrong and uh, that are prevailing in immature democracies that do not allow uh, a good consideration of the costs and, or, and benefits of reforms. And the conclusion is that reforms are always unadvisable and politicians contribute to this uh, idea. And uh, they push these theses that impede uh, reforms. So what are the stakeholders involved in these uh, uh, reform processes? We have precedents uh, to talk about certain uh, officials. Uh, we have uh, it's also uh, very prestigious personalities. We have parties represented in parliament. Sometimes these parties are very high in number. So it's not enough to have five, six, or, or seven uh, parties uh, reaching agreement. If there is a charismatic leader able to persuade these uh, parties to reach a consensus in parliament, that will be uh, a very good uh, solution. And we also have uh, social actors. So we should think about the characteristics of the leaders as uh, Mr. Price was saying. Social actors are very important in this process and they come from the labor field. You need a, a, a system that will uh, be favorable to the pension systems. Sometimes they are involved not only with issues of 
gender, but also age qualifications. There are big gaps in this uh, field. And uh, the society must have, must be indebted with them in, uh, through generations in order to uh, give voice to the millions of people uh, who have not uh, um, contributed enough to maintain a good uh, pension, because there are many people in that uh, circumstance and their political actors that uh, do not uh, allow a, a good pension reform to go through. The Turner Commission is a good example of uh, vehicles for agreement, and uh, they could have a decisive uh, role in this area. We need uh, expert uh, officials uh, from inside and outside the system. And uh, if someone does not is not able to calculate the consequences of uh, increasing the retirement age, uh, change the formula for the calculation of pensions, if you don't have an expert involved, then we will not be able to take into account these factors, age, life expectancy, and uh, uh, the level of contribution that is optimal. In, uh, in Spain, a certain level could be advisable. Uh, and uh, if we take into account the wages that uh, workers are receiving, uh, then you, be, you will be able to compute the ex effective uh, quota to be contributed by each worker. But uh, for this, we need experts. Otherwise, uh, the result will not be uh, adequate. So technicians are necessary, and they should be listened to. Uh, the great uh, commissions that have been created were um, composed mainly of uh, technicians who were able to do simulations and to see what can happen if we change the uh, formula or if we alter the period to compute the pensionable basis for a, a worker. And this should be in the hands of uh, technicians. It's one of the most difficult areas uh, to change in, in a patient system. It's much easier to handle public debt than pensions. Uh, public debt is uh, handled uh, in a different way. And uh, it, uh, this, not only, this is not only in a uh, developed country, but in a uh, developing country as well. Unless the men in black need to come in, the case in Greece. And there's a factor that works quite well in some countries like France. People go out on the street to burn cars and buses and stop any reform, whether it be pensions, labor market or what have you. They've got 42 pension systems in France. One is for the cheminot, the railway uh, drivers, which dates back to uh, the last century when you had to load coal onto the engines. And today, trains in France are driven almost telepathically. You don't need to even touch a lever and still the pension systems remain the same, uh, allows you to take early retirement, very early. And President Macron has tried to do just that, to change things. So what can you do? Someone comes along and starts to pontificate and uh, our ch pensions change from one day to the next? No, obviously not. Presidential initiative, parliamentary, debate is very frequent with all sorts of outcomes. Sometimes it leads to nothing if you don't have an absolute majority or the debate is somewhat more gentle and friendly and consensus of reach, especially when the debate is well informed through experts as a case in, uh, this is a case in Sweden, very knowledgeable people. Um, and you get to convince people that if you don't undertake reforms, you're going to lose so much in each group. And well, having seen the figures, 
it's easy to reach consensus. So parliamentary commissions can be internal, external, mixed. You can have ministerial commissions, the case of the UK. And uh, of course, um, we have very interesting examples. Look at what happened in Australia, an Anglo-Saxon country. I'm using the alphabetical order. Anglo-Saxon countries are the only countries that copy of each other for good. You know, they look at alternatives, and this is based on relatively simple parliamentary consensus. I won't read everything out, but I'll highlight a few dates. 1909 was a milestone year. Since then, pension reforms haven't been revolutionary. There have been some reforms from time to time that have been building up the system. And very few advanced countries had uh, such systems in the early 20th century. Australia did have one. In the reunified Germany, well, and towards the end of the 20th century under Otto von Bismarck, they had a system. Uh, well, also in the United Kingdom, there was a reform in the US under President Roosevelt's New Deal. In 1991, Australia did something very interesting by giving a final boost in making Pillar 2 mandatory. In continental Europe, there's a concern with social security, and it would seem that the only pensions that exist are social security pensions. And I'm talking to representatives of the Latin American world where social security has for many years suffered all sorts of challenges. In many of these countries, the problem is that the labor market is highly irregular. And no matter how rational the pension system has uh, been attempted to be dealt with, it can't follow such an irregular labor market. In Spain, it is often said that the Chilean model is a failure. And that's not true. I always say that the Chilean system is very good for workers who can contribute enough throughout the course of their working life. And it's a very good system that has shown it works well, but very few workers can fully participate for 30, 35, or 40 years because the labor markets are highly irregular. And therefore, the uh, pension system can't meet the needs of millions and millions of workers who don't have the rights or benefits. So what happens uh, is that Social Security in such circumstances can only offer hunger pensions. In Australia, there have been good examples of serene, continuous reforms that have prioritized Social Security on the one hand by offering a floor, and then you have the employment or pillar two pensions that supplement a considerable share and for a couple of decades have been made mandatory. And this is a very important reform. In France, everything has stopped. Everything is at a standstill. COVID obviously also uh, help to stop this. But anyway, the um, Macron reform was on its last legs, even though it was being um, supported by the French president. And of course, the idea was to condense the 42 pension systems into two or three by unifying scattered systems. And of course, the substitution or replacement rate in France is quite uh, important, of course. There's the professional retirement funds. There's pay as you go there. It's very complex to handle all that. And of course, citizens play 
a key role here, citizens support um, or not as evidence on the streets. The thing about France is that it's got a highly personalist uh, system, and uh, this is why things unfold the way they do. Uh, we don't really know much about what's going to happen with the French reform. The French system is very change reluctant. It is a social security, pensions, and professional retirement fund system that is based on pay as you go, and they face the same problems as social security with exorbitant contribution rates, the highest in the um, continent apart from Belgium and Germany. Very few people talk about Social Security in the United States as if it didn't exist, when in fact, they've got 160 million workers, in addition to the millions of pensioners that get Medicare. So if you're 65 or older, you're entitled to Medicare. Those who have insufficient resources have Medicaid, it's a different level, but it provides comprehensive health care. And social security pensions give you 30% of your latest salary. Has anyone heard about the social security pension reform during the Clinton, Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump campaigns? No reference was made to pensions in that campaign. In the United States, the greatest overhaul of the pension reform in decades was underway at the time. And what does that kind of major reform mean in the United States? It's a reform of parameters that is uh, carried out. Um, there's a chief actuary that every so many years produces a report telling Congress what it needs to do. As part of the ordinary sessions of Congress, there's no special commission. They come together and reach some form of agreement. There's consultation, but there's not that much to uh, be said by the trades unions or even the employers. The role of the chief actuary, of the office of the chief actuary, is crucial as they're keeping an eye to make sure that trust funds are not exhausting, that the parametric reforms are conducted. And so this is how the, re the pension eligibility age is um, raised gradually. When you look at the actuary's report, and it says that by 2040 something, the trust fund will end, some are scandalized, but the initiated know that this will actually define a reform and that in a matter of just a few years, things get sorted out. The thing is that um, workers get most of their employment uh, of their pension components from employment pensions, in addition to the 30% amount provided by Social Security. What about the Netherlands? They have the best pension system in the world. Social Security only gives you 30% of your latest wage, and employment pensions give you 70%. You then receive 100% of your latest salary. Uh, most workers get this, thanks to the 70% of the um, company pension and 30% of social security. So you might not even need social security to have a decent pension after long years of work. The problem in the Netherlands is one that pension reforms have focused on, and it is the fact that almost all pillar two contracts provide for defined benefits. And this is very risky. The existential issue for the Dutch is whether the pension fund is duly funded or not. And it is often not the case. Now there's a reform underway, which hasn't taken that long or discussion. Everyone agrees on it. And before 
2026 or by the end of 2026, all defined benefits plans need to go or switch to defined contribution. And this will mobilize 500 billion euros and not all companies will be able to do this, of course. There will be an interesting business going on with low fees for those who introduce the changes. But the Netherlands has needed no Toledo packs or unusual commissions or complicated processes. Trades unions are asked and are very sensitive and they act responsibly. Ireland is a newcomer in terms of pension reforms. They have a um, system that is very close to the continental system, and with support of the Swedish specialists, and especially with the support of Ed Palmer, since 2018, they have gone about transforming their social security system fashioning it on the basis of the Swedish system. And the idea is to rationalize social security systems by introducing an actuarial layer in a pay-as-you-go system that would otherwise not work. So these reforms, mainly in social security, take a long time. Trade unions also object to some things, but they will not interrupt reforms. If there's an issue that concerns them, things are discussed, and obviously some matters are related to the increase in life expectancy. Between 1992 and 2004, Italy had five pension reforms, some of them contradictory. In Italy, under Dini, they um, introduced changes, and things are done following political initiatives by the ruling parties in Italy. and the reforms do not really deliver the intended results. So you need to take everything they do with a pinch of salt. The reform is to turn Social Security into a notional account system. They were one of the first countries after Sweden to adopt notional accounts. Early retirement mechanisms are very many and they still exist. And the, the World Bank is very familiar with the situation in Italy, and we're all expecting to see what will happen in Italy. New Zealand is a very interesting case. The social security is dealt with. It's just 30% of the latest paycheck, but that doesn't create problems. But business pensions, company pensions are important. And here, the issue was to determine the cost level, creating a vehicle that could be accepted by all workers, regardless of age, of status, of pay level, leaving out no workers on any ground so that they could contribute even a small amount. This is the Kiwi saver with great little behavioral nudges built into the rules with multiple automatic mechanisms such as auto-enrollment. They were among the first countries to adopt auto-enrollment. 
And they, again, copy each other. This club of Anglo-Saxon countries copy models of each other. And we should also do that and take advantage of best practices. There are no political issues in New Zealand. Different administrations have been in office and have actually uh, worked on the basis of the arrangements decided by previous administrations. They work on a progressive, gradual basis. I don't need to talk about the UK, of course. We've already discussed the Turner report, and Lord Turner and his two partners who came from the trades union and corporate world, and of course, there was also the academic uh, world represented. There was Jenny Drake, the former president of the trades union Congress, and John Hills, a great academic from the London School of Economics. And several commissions have worked and taken their time. This has required many years, but now we can see some concrete, verifiable data pointing to the results of this reform undertaken 17 years ago, two decades ago. Sweden is a paradigm for countries with a strong social security system that needs to adapt because otherwise it's going to explode in terms of debt. It will not be able to pay what it is promising, such as 80% of the latest paycheck. The Palmer report was the result of the working group that began in 1991. So this was a gradual development process, and now it's about the nursing of the reform. As William said earlier, this system works on the basis of symmetric uh, automatic systems, because if the symmetry is not there, it's no good. And basically, we have a kind of racket effect so that when inflation goes down, um, there's a, an adjustment is made accordingly. Sweden is a true paradigm for many European countries, both uh, continental and uh, others. It Italy has applied this, but in their own way, and uh, There is the reluctance to apply notional accounts or defined benefit contributions. The Toledo Pact is a form of consensus not to talk about those things and to continue to build up debt going forward until this is made to stop. And these are some sources that I have used. The conclusions are that you can't say that there is an established protocol to carry out a structural pension reform. There are many different procedures. Sometimes there is improvisation, and only Anglo-Saxon countries and some Nordic countries seem to have a wish to emulate good practices, which creates um, a model in fact, and it is not always necessary to carry out structural reforms. Australia and the United States are case in point. As long as parametric reforms are ongoing, and in Spain in 2021, we discarded the reform 
of 2013. We have gone backwards and lost out. We missed a whole decade. So the next reform will be harder in order to stabilize the system. It's not just about pensions being enough, but about them being sustainable and fair. Often, when things are done in an arbitrary way, the fairness is not there. Social security reforms take much longer than pillar two and pillar three reforms, that is to say, employment and uh, personal reforms. The idea is that you need the competitiveness, the low costs. Social security reforms are very slow. We have seen this in Australia and New Zealand. There is a lot of self-management. And sometimes you need negotiation vehicles. And there are advanced countries in which company pensions are more important already than social security pensions. Some more sources here. So thank you very much.